everyone. Thank you so much for joining the Behind Company Lines podcast. Today we have Lee Blaylock, co-founder and CEO of Construction Bevy. Construction Bevy is a fintech-enabled marketplace for the commercial construction industry. Lee, I'm so excited to chat with you. And, and as we were talking about for the show, not only your wealth of knowledge as an entrepreneur, building companies, but also this interesting aspect, I think, that we're all kind of, as consumers, not necessarily aware of, but but we're impacted by it, which is this ecosystem of commercial construction and development. And really curious on, I think we've seen a lot of these pieces being a little bit segmented and and, and it, it's going to be exciting to see how Construction Bevy is kind of bringing those pieces together. But before we get into the company, what were you doing before you started Construction Bevy? So this is my fourth startup. I have what I call the defective gene of an entrepreneur. The great thing about being an entrepreneur is you stop working full-time for somebody else. You start working half days for yourself. The only question is, which 12 hours a day, seven days a week do you want to work? So my first uh, company was a company called Service Lane. It was funded by Austin Ventures, Silicon Valley Bank, Fremont Ventures. I was in the late 90s. I sold that to Owens Corning. I started an investment management business called Annandale Capital. I'm super proud of that. It's a Financial Times 300 firm. We manage over a little over a billion and a half in assets. As my idea to start, I was a second largest shareholder. I did that for seven years. And then I, the predecessor business, this was called Nice Leads. And we're actually rolling yeah. nicely this. And it's kind of like a, think about it as a tender meets LinkedIn, where yeah. you actually yeah. identify the companies that you want to meet and who you want to network with in terms of the types of people. And it's yeah. a matching service. Where if my contacts can help you in business, your ta- contacts can help me. We both pass this networking privacy filter. Then there's a high degree of likely that we want to meet. And yeah. through that journey, that's how we came up with the construction baby. It's so fascinating thinking of obviously kind of the, the acquisition process, but also you, your your time and investment in building that portfolio. What are some things that you, you were seeing, even through your experience and, and how companies who wanted to achieve their goals and achieve success, what are some of the foundational things that they need to operate with or, or strategically have in place before going and starting to scale their companies? There's a lot to unpack there. So <laughs> I think uh, I subscribe to the theory that every great entrepreneur has to know something that few other people know. And if they have insights that are ahead of the market, but they're not too far ahead, because if you're too far ahead, you're wrong. But if they've got insights and their insights represent a large market, then they can find great opportunity. And oftentimes an entrepreneur has to be comfortable being misunderstood potentially for a long time before things materialize. Now, if you go into banking or your doctor or something, that's entirely different. But if you're a maker, if you're an entrepreneur that's building software, kind of building the future of what could be, those principles adhere. The other one is that you've got to find a real problem. Don't just do yeah. something because you think it's cool. Go find yeah. something that is a real problem because you don't want to be a problem looking for a solution. I was going to have yeah. a solution looking for a problem. You want a, a problem to go, okay, here's something that people will pay for. Yeah, yeah. And and when obviously I think what defines a lot of that is maybe going through a lot of customer interviews, going through a lot of trial and error. But what do you leaned on when you've kind of started companies, even when you were starting construction baby from its initial idea, what kind of kind of conceived your f- first initial idea and, and how did you iterate on that and, and get to where you were today? What are the steps you took to get there? So the first part of your question is interesting because there are some people that want, are there some, there's, there's one viewpoint that says you have to be an authentic entrepreneur. You have to know that problem. You have to understand everything. And others, are, you, know, you know what? You don't want to be shackled by the way the world works. Yeah. So if you look yeah. at traffic block, at Uber, if you look at Brian Chesney and the guys at Airbnb, they didn't come from those industries and they came in and they disrupted them. And so oftentimes it's really about the grit of the entrepreneur and do they have the mental fortitude to go through the, the very difficult days that, that are inevitably going to happen? And do they have passion for what they're doing? Because if they don't have passion for what they're doing, they're going right. to get kicked out of the arena pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. And, and in terms of when, when you kind of started to build the idea and, and, and go and find product market fit, you said it, it kind of started as one idea, shifted into what Construction Bevy is. And today, what were some of the signals you were looking for to move the product in, in the direction? One founder told me that product market fit is just a, time, it's a, it's a moment in time, which kind of conceptualized the idea that it continues to shift. I agree with it all. No? Yeah, no? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I would love to hear your response to that. I mean, so... If your product doesn't continually fit the market, you're, you're not going to succeed, right? Yeah. That's yeah, the way yeah. I would, it may be some nuances and I'm not, not picking up, but the essence of it is, is that we had a business networking application. We went, talked to a very large manufacturer. They liked it a lot. And through the course of conversation, we were listening to them about some of the yeah, challenges that they had around 
basically aligning in, in the commercial construction world, manufacturers yeah. generally sell to subcontractors. And those subcontractors, they're working with general contractors in the bidding process to win a project from an owner or developer. And there are going to be multiple general contractors that are trying to win that deal in many cases, not all, but in many cases. And so if you're pricing a subcontractor that's working with a general contractor that loses the deal, it doesn't matter what your relationship is. You have no ability to put materials on the ground. And so the original concept was to basically build a contractor tool that gave kind of statistical probability of this owner, who's the most, who are the most likely general contractors and who are the most likely subcontractors to do that. And in a commercial pro, we don't do any single family residential. In a commercial project, they're anywhere between kind of 30 to over 100 trades, generally speaking in the 45 to 60 trades that would be on site building a building that's seven stories tall. And so as we were speaking with these manufacturers, we also went to, this, to the general contractors and said, hey, what do you think about this? And if you're a traveling general contractor, going and hooking your spurs into a retailer and they take you to a market you've never been to, or it's been four or five years and the market dynamics have shifted, it's a bayonet business for them to figure out who are the subs we have to work with. And then once they do find that sub, the most difficult problem they have is what's called pre-qualification. And if I'm a general and you're a sub and I like your bid because it's the lowest or the right bid, I don't just give you the contract. I take you through an underwriting process. You yeah. have the right insurance, right financials, the right safety, right legal, the right capacity. And after you go through that process, I may or may not give you a contract, but I may or may not give you a size of a contract that you're interested in because it's, it's, it's basically an underwriting process. And yeah. without going into the details, that industry, that part of the industry is really broken. And yeah. so it's listening to, if you don't come from the industry, it's listening to customers and then applying your lessons from other industries yeah. that you bring in. And in this particular case, we are the only PLG company in the sector, meaning a product-led growth company. So if you think about an Oracle or an SAP, you, you've got to go, or, or even a Salesforce to most degrees, you've got to go do a demo, pay them before you start using the application. If you think about Dropbox, you think about Slack, you think about some of the more modern t tools, LinkedIn's another one. You don't have to go pay LinkedIn to start using it. You do if you're on monster.com, but you don't have to if you're on LinkedIn. And so a product-led growth organization allows you to have your customers teach you and they teach you what they do, and then you take that through machine learning and AI, and then you sell that information back to them or to others. That's a really powerful way to grow a business much more rapidly because you're not dependent upon hiring a bunch of salespeople and going out and doing those things. So listening to customers or what their problem is and then applying other lessons from other businesses is what we're doing here at Construction Baby. It's so fascinating thinking about like that relationship with the customer as you're building also. And, and what are some of the things that you have to say, not listen to, and, and is it because not enough customers are giving you the right signal to, they build out a feature request or something particular, how do you identify what you need to invest more resources, time, or even more technical feature set into? That's a good question. So great entrepreneurs, like great investors, they look for pattern recognition. Pattern recognition can come in a variety of different ways. Obviously, speaking with a lot of customers or just something that's like, okay, we obviously need to have this, right? And at the end of the day, when you are an early stage business or your late stage business, you have your large customers who are paying you six, seven, eight figures sometimes, and you have your smaller customers. And you don't want one or the other to unduly sway your product direction. You should have a really clear direction of where your product's going, but you should be very flexible in listening to how your customers and how you get there. And don't just do what your large customers want and don't do just what your small customers want. And the art of entrepreneurship is trying to figure out the balance between, hey, we got to go take care of these big accounts, but we also have these other things that are being requested by our customers. But at the end of the day, customers don't really understand what features are possible they understand their business problem. They wake up in the morning. They don't think about your business. They think about their business. And they think about, what are my problems? And so there's a classic example of in the horse and buggy, right? If I came to you and say, hey, how can we make this horse and buggy faster? Well, you may be the different species of the horse, or maybe you make the wheels different, or maybe you lighten the load of, of the buggy. They wouldn't come up with the internal combustion engine. And so what they understood is they needed to get from point A to point B as fast and safe as possible. And so as an entrepreneur, you have to balance that. Okay, I want to listen to them, but I also want to help them understand what the future self could look like. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's identifying the overall objective or value or incentive that someone is is kind of moving towards, right? If if you're a if you make wine, you you want to have the best ingredients. You want to have all this the, the what's needed ingredients and ecosystem to be able to accomplish a strong product. And if anything's helping that, it's got to be towards that objective. Otherwise, then it's just superfluous, right? Then it doesn't really gain a lot of traction to to in an in adoption as well and just thinking about that piece as well like the adoption component how did you when you built the product out you had a few customers on it what kind of got you to the level of, of being able to broadcast it and get it kind of more widely used were you finding new customers to reach out to were you improving the product and just doubling down on your initial profile of of, of customers what in particular kind of helped you and, and kind of what did you strategically do to grow your product? Let me address that, but let me touch on something you were talking about earlier, like, like yeah. wine, right? And not be, I mean, I collect wine, but it's not about that. <laughs> yeah. First thing I was thinking about is if you are building something, um, you have to understand your audience and you have to deliver something that's consistent. If you're a winemaker or if you're a restaurateur or if you're in many other businesses and you're like this one day and you're like this another day, well, you're not going to find your audience, right? If you're this price, this one day, and this price another day. And so you really need to understand what your audience is, what their motivations are, what their pain points are. Another dynamic that I look at is, are you a, a selling a vitamin or are you selling a painkiller? And you can make money doing both. I mean, to you and me, Facebook is a vitamin. We don't have to have it, everything else. But if I'm a advertiser and I want to find a left-handed purple yak milker, Google and, and Facebook are the easiest ways to go segment that. And so that's, they're a painkiller for advertisers. So that dynamic of really understanding your customer, understanding what they need and consistently delivering that is really important. The second part of your question is more about how do we kind of go to market? How do we come up with the idea? What, what, kind of help me understand that again? Yeah. Once you kind of, you, you, you kind of proved out the concept, what's your strategy from there? Are you going out and broadcasting your, are you doubling down on marketing? Are you expanding your customers on who you can, can service? What in particular, once you reach that stage where you, you had some traction, some success, yeah, expand your product line. Yes, yeah, so let me touch on something I said earlier, and then I'll, I'll build on that. So if you look at the largest businesses that got the fastest out there today, you think about a Dropbox, you think about Uber, you think about Airbnb, you think about LinkedIn and others. What they did is that they had their customers teach them. Mm. And then they took that through machine learning, and then they sold that information back to them or to others. And that's the way that you scale up really fast businesses these days. Because it's just too hard to go hire all the sales reps and do everything that's happened to happen. So you have to have a really clever strategy. And if you think about marketplaces, such as Uber, Airbnb, Etsy, eBay, YouTube is actually a marketplace. None of those businesses had a dynamic where one side, say the supplier or the demand, could compel the other side to join the network. They just didn't have it. Now, it's called the cold yeah. start swap or the chicken and the egg. And those companies obviously not only solved it. They solved it in spades. And that's why we yeah. talk about it. But the majority of the marketplaces that are out there that fail, they fail to get what's called liquidity in the marketplace, where yeah. you get a good solid balance of both people posting and people asking. Craigslist is another great example. Right? Yeah. So what's really attracted me to what we built here is that we call on commercial general contractors with a freemium product, i.e., they don't have to pay for it if they don't want to. No. They just use the base product and they can use that ad infinitum. And then they compel their subcontractors to get on it because they have to go qualify these subcontractors. And if the contractor doesn't either want to bid in certain cases or they don't want to actually get the contract, then they can they have to be on this this platform. And so we have now the what's called the demand side basically gets the supply side. The supply side has to play ball. And there yeah. are a few other examples we can go into, Ariba and others. They do that, but this is very, very attractive because when we sign up a general contractor based on the size of the general contractor, the viral coefficient can be in the thousands. Yeah. So when you sign, say, Instagram or Facebook, you might in invite a couple of your friends or 10 of your friends or scores of your friends, but you're not inviting thousands and thousands, right? Yeah. If you're a large general contractor and you're on this platform, you're inviting thousands of subcontractors and mm. we get to acquire those, contra those uh, contractors for free. That's incredible. And in, in, in terms of like, how do you continue that? Like, it, it's such, it's such a, it's, it's a very, it's a very interesting model because you almost automated that your supply side in terms of bringing those people in. And then how do you kind of 
exchange that service on the platform and, and, and kind of lead to transacting? So when a, a viral coefficient is a really, really important thing to understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For every user that joins a platform, how many people do they invite? How quickly do they do that? And how quickly do those people convert? And what smart businesses do is they find multiple viral hooks and viral loops in their application so that each entity that joins accelerates the growth of the business. Right. And we spend a lot of time on onboarding, on UX flows, on understanding how can we simplify the process so that when we get a customer to come on board, they're inviting many other people, not just a GC inviting a lot of subs. Like every employee of that general yeah. contractor or employee of the, say, the CPA firm or the insurance firm or others that are part of this ecosystem. So those yeah. are really important dynamic that we try to, try to put in place. And then you supplement that with additional information. We believe long-term search engine optimization will probably be our most fruitful environment. Because when you're looking for, once again, a left-handed purple yak milker, you go and type in that into, uh, into Google, we want construction baby to show up because right. that's what you're looking for. And we want that to do. So think about how good Wikipedia is. Wikipedia yeah. has done a phenomenal job. And there, we can go on with other companies that done a great job at SEO. And so a combination, and there's no one silver bullet, a combination of direct sales, product-led growth, viral coefficients, and then everything from content farms to the ability to have distribution partnerships with sure. various companies that are in your sector. Those are all things that you really need to lever yeah. if you're going to grow the business and grow it rapidly. And, you, and when you say content farm, is that just like building assets as a kind of a thought leader in the space? Yeah. So one of the companies that I've always admired the most in, in, when I started Annandale Capital, I was doing a lot of research and there's a company out there called Seeking Alpha. And Seeking Alpha is a platform for portfolio managers to publish, self-publish through a, a quasi editorial process, but pretty much self-publish articles that they believe are important for you to understand this particular trend in finance or this particular stock or this particular sector, this particular financial yeah. product. And it's very clear that they are a portfolio manager for XYZ firm, but it gives them the ability to have a voice. And so yeah. kind of thinking is like a medium or a sub stack, but it's only for financial interest. And so those kind of things have always interested me because most people are a lot more interested in their career than they are what their business is. Yeah. And if you can help them amplify what they're doing, you're going to find an audience that wants to participate and generate content that could be interesting to your clients. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it, for, I, I love kind of how you strategically kind of hack certain you know, waves and in, in not only growth, but understanding your product and, and your customer base. And also just to gain some context for the audience sake, what's been exciting about the traction you've seen up to this point and what are particularly excited about in terms of the next milestones of Construction Bevy and, and what you're looking forward to? So we're really early inning. So we formed the legal entity on June 1st, 2021. We've had working code now for a year, but we've been really in stealth mode. We haven't done anything other than one trade show because we know we have 15 general contractors, subcontractors, and insurance executives as investors. And we have roughly a dozen owners as investors, including one I'm really proud of, Emily Dreyer, who runs global real estate for Dell Computer. And we know that if we make those folks happy, then we're going to find other customers that see, see it to be very attractive. And yes, we're calling on other companies. We absolutely are doing that right now. But at the, at the end of the day, we know that by making those customers happy and getting product market fit, because the only thing my team is working on right now is product market fit. And product market fit is a little bit like that definition of porn. You know when you see yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so people say it's growing 7% of your customer base a week. Uh, yeah. On a basis over a 52-week period. And so the faster you grow, the more engaged your customers are, then obviously the, and, and obviously the lack of churn, and then obviously converting to paid accounts, those are really key. So. Yeah. Our focus right now is on making our, we call them inside the tent, our inside the tent customers, investors really happy, and then selectively spending time on outside pursuits where we get introductions or some kind of advantage. And then we're starting the email marketing blast too, because now our part product's ready. It's been yeah. battle tested. It works, works really well. And we're just out there increasing the features and really focusing on the analytics. Because if you are giving your product away, and you don't have the framework and the analytics on this, then what happens is you're going to basically be giving away. A product-led growth is really a data-led business. 
And that's really, really important that you've got the data and you've got the framework and you've got the data yeah. warehouse, you can, you know, architecture to really understand the behavior of customers so you can make good decisions. Yeah. So, so well said. And, and if you think about it, whether it's external or internal, what are some of the biggest risks that you think the company faces today? I think in this environment, financing risk is always something. But if an entrepreneur doesn't think that financing risk is an issue, they, they don't understand it. I, I've been around a while. I've seen 01, I've seen 08. This is the worst investment environment since 08. Yeah. It's not even close. And the difficulty here is that the Fed's out of bullets. Back in 08, interest rates were a lot higher. The Fed could lower them. Well, the Fed kept them down too low, too long, too free money. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal literally in the last two or three days that there's $1.5 trillion of commercial mortgages that are coming due in the next 36 months. And the estimates are that more than a third of those owners are going to be giving the keys back to the banks and to the lenders because they have no equity in the building. Wow. And so- we're, we're going to be in for a hard slog. Who knows how long it's going to last, et cetera. If you're in semiconductors and you're in other technologies that are growth industries, you might be a little insulated. But if you are not yeah. and you're in more traditional businesses, it's going to suck over the next couple of quarters and maybe next couple of years. And yeah. so uh, those are the kinds of things that we really think through. And how can we be selling, once again, a painkiller as opposed to a vitamin? Yeah, yeah. And if everything goes well, what's the long-term vision for the company? We believe this is a publicly traded business. At the end of the day, when you look at the market size we've got, you look at the team that we have, the board that we have, and the, the, the product execution, the business model, we believe that this company is a publicly traded business. And I'm the entrepreneur that says, hey, if there's one drop in the vial, the glass is half, half full, right? I mean, yeah. I get that. <laughs> I, I, uh, and I understand yeah. the statistical anomaly that it takes just to get to an exit, much less to a public exit. Yeah. But I start, my badge number was 244 at Dell Computer. When I started, it was about $58 million. When I left, there were four and a half billion. So I understand kind of what that looks and what that feels like. Yeah. Uh, and we love our chances. Yeah. I love this next section. I call it my founder FAQ. So I'm going to hit you with some rapid fire question and we'll see what we get. Fire so one. I love it. For, first thing I like to ask to open it up is what's particularly hard about your job day to day? Well, that's a good question. For me, I'm an idea factory. And so the great idea, the great thing about working with me is like, I got really good ideas. The bad thing is I got a lot of really good ideas, right? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. It is prioritization. And I tell you, I struggled with that for a long time and I still to this day is how do we take the ideas that we have and how do we prioritize them and how do we focus the organization? Yeah. And one of the benefits of working with me is oftentimes the, the negative working with me. That's the case here is that yeah. I need to be more measured in terms of when I bring up ideas to the team. Mm. And I've tried to mature how I do that over time. Yeah. Thinking about your experience and, and you mentioned it a second ago, what has to go well for companies to lead to that exit? What, what are some of the, the things that you can focus on? Lot. Yeah. <laughs> the, the first thing reminds me of is I got three kids and I remember the doctor talk, talking to the first kid. If, if you had any idea of all of the things that had to go right to have a healthy child, you'd never have one. That's the same thing. You had any it. idea what it would take to be a successful in business, very few people yeah. have to do it. Yeah. And it, they mentioned it earlier, it really comes down to grit and timing yeah. and other things. Is, yeah. I, I, for the last 10 years, I volunteered for an organization called Startup Grind. Yeah. It's mission to educate, inspire, and connect entrepreneurs. Dallas was like the fifth or sixth chapter, and we have now 600 chapters in 130 countries. And so I interview entrepreneurs on a monthly basis and really try to understand what's going on there. And at the end of the day, it's called startup grind, not startup joy, yeah. because it can be a real grind at times. And you have to have that passion because that passion is what's going to keep you going through the hard times. Yeah. You know, thinking about, I guess, your commercial industry overall, I know you mentioned some things with, with where you know, a lot of that's going. How do you see it changing consumers and consumerism being that some of the commercial businesses that, that we're occupying spaces, we're serving customers are either beat out because of the cost of, of being open or businesses moving towards more of e-commerce play. What do you see kind of consumerism changes as, as this, you, you see a lot of these commercial businesses handing the keys back? I think there's an acceleration of the consumerization of IT. Mm -hmm. We have for many years, since 2007, technically, but that's when the smartphones announced, but the 2008 is really when the App Store came around. Most people now are pretty familiar with how high quality, high UX value consumer applications work. And we're bringing that to the commercial market. The commercial construction industry, by some 
estimates is the second slowest adopter of technology behind only K through 12 education. Um, really? But all projects have Wi-Fi now. Everybody's yeah. on a pad. They've got a computer. There's nothing structural behind anything that says, hey, this is not the time for something like this. But it is interesting that we do not have in 2023, a, basically a LinkedIn for the commercial construction industry. Um, and some companies that we people say, say they do that, but it's behind a private database. Like it's not a LinkedIn, it's not a yeah. public open database. And so at the end of the day, I think that's a, a key component that we're taking what we expect from the ease and from the intuitive nature of high quality consumer products. Yeah. And we're expecting those now in enterprise class products. Yeah. Thinking about building technology and adopting it into older industries, what are some companies that you kind of look upon or, or build kind of in, 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 or inspire you in, in how you can utilize the way it's impacted its industry into construction, commercial industry in particular? Any, any, any inspirations behind how you're building it? Yeah, so there's a lot. Don't want to give too, up too much of the secret sauce, but I am enamored by Google. Yeah. Uh, I think that Google is... One of the few businesses that does not have, everybody talking about chat API, chat GPT, but it does not have a existential threat to their business model that's clear and present. They don't have a single competitor that could kick them out. Yeah. And their execution and their culture of really moving the needle in terms of what's possible and taking big, bold risks. And they could do that because AdWords is such a phenomenally profitable yeah. product. They can do these moonshots. And so the Google model, not only in their business model, but how they run their business, uh, how they operate their business. Several of our employees and investors are from Google as well. So we've got, I, I never spent time there, but I've studied it a lot. I've, I've been, I've spent a lot of time on the Google campus. That would be probably number one. Yeah. And so any business that is a PLG business, a product led growth business is where I'm going to get inspiration from. Yeah. Any business that is highly focused on the user experience and delivering really good value is something that I learned from. And things that come to mind, Figma, I think is a, is a phenomenal tool. I think Slack is a phenomenal tool. I think Stripe is a phenomenal tool. And so we look at various elements of those, whether it be their user, their team management, or their user onboarding, or their, it's another one, their, their paywall. Yeah. Another really good product is TurboTax. TurboTax is taking you through a process that nobody likes to go through, but they do it in a wizard way and they've spent a lot of money doing what they're doing, but they do a very good job. And so I take inspiration from anything that delights the user. Yeah. It's, it's also interesting too, TurboTax developers are famously like, they can't, like they're safeguarded and they're not, there's not a lot of TurboTax developers out there that, because they've created such a uniquely specific product. Um, but I agree. I, I, I love inspirations you drive from kind of thinking about adding value in different ways, creative models and things about capturing a brand or a consistent message, things like that are always really cool and inspiring. I always like to, to ask to this. That point, yeah, please. To that point, quick. So TurboTax and believe it or not, Waze, they mm -hmm. have over 10,000 plus, like a lot more than 10,000, just volunteers. Yeah. So a lot of TurboTax's customer support is volunteers who literally will go into the tax code because that's what makes them happy and they will answer. And Scott Cook and others at, at, at Intuit, they brought in some of their volunteers. One of them has actually, over the years, has answered over a million questions on tax yeah. and get paid for it. It's just, they just enjoy it. Or I'm a map geek and I want to help raise with maps. Um, yeah. And so every business can find their center. They can find their true north. And they can find their, I call them early evangelists. They're early, yeah. early, not only evangelists, but they're early as well. So go find your early evangelists and help them and enable them to help you grow your business. Yeah. If you weren't working on construction, Bevy, what would you be doing? Pardon me? If you weren't working oh, well, on no. that. Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously I like golf, but if I, if I had my <laughs> druthers, I, I, want, I grew up wanting to be a Formula One race driver. And yeah. I didn't do, do bupkis about it. So I, it's just like, oh, it kind of sounds good. And the other thing is I really was be interested for a long time to be an Egyptologist, just fascinating what, what was going on there, the math associated with building those buildings. And yeah. but I, I'm th that defective entrepreneur. So if I wasn't doing this, I would be doing something else yeah. because what motivates me is being able to pick the team I work with, because I know that if I pick a fabulous team and we execute, Hey, we're going to, 
go change the world. And if I still pick a fabulous team, we don't execute very well. At least I'm enjoying the people I work with and I'm not eating crap sandwiches, walking yes. to the office every day because I want to go. I, I, basically, I want to get a speeding ticket, come to the office because I want to work with the people I'm working with. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And and something to kind of uh, give to the audience, if you can share any book or per, individual who, whether it's early in your career or now, have, have impacted you or left a, a lasting lesson that's helped you even today, anything you'd like to share? There's actually, I have a blog post on Medium and it talks about like the 15 books that uh, shaped my life. The first one, Waddy Piper, the engine, little engine that could, right? Yeah. Love that book from growing up. Uh, phenomenal book about this engine. I think I can. I think I, I thought I could. I thought I could. As I tell my kids, I said, if you believe you can or you believe you can't, then you are right. Yeah. So it's about attitude. So that was the first one. Another one early on was Who Moved My Cheese? You can read the whole damn thing in an hour, but it's, you got Scat and Scurry and Him and Haw, and it's really a life's lesson about, hey, your cheese got moved. Are you going to be scurry around? Or are you just going to Him and Haw and let the world yeah. do something? Those two things are, are really key. Clayton Christensen's How Would You Measure Your Life? What more important question yeah. do you have there? Clayton Christensen also has a book called The Innovator's Dilemma of Why Do Great Companies Fail? For me, that was a really seminal book. I've got over 420 books on golf course architecture. So in my <laughs> spirit, I like to read about that. I've got 403 book, uh, 403 golf balls in the order that I played them in 16 countries. So obviously that's my hobby. But in terms of uh, business books, some of those are the key things. Obviously the yeah. Bible is really important to me as well. But if somebody wants to look up, just kind of lead Laylock medium books, you probably find it. And it gives a little vignette on each one and why. Uh, another yeah. one most recently, it's pretty dense, is Ray Dalio's Principles. I think yeah. Ray Dalio, founder of Bridgewater, he's, he's obviously done phenomenal things. And, and one thing that I really admire mostly about the tech industry, but Ray as well, is that the tech industry will give you all kinds of content about how they did it. And they don't really hold back anything. Yeah. You don't see yeah. it in a lot of industries. You don't see people in the oil industry or in the XYZ industry really giving you literally the recipes to yeah. help go increase your user engagement or increase this or increase that. And I really admire Ray Dalio for what he's done. Now, he at Bridgewater, they have a really unique culture where they video every single meeting and yeah. tape every meeting. And so there's transparency that throws away about 30% of their new hires every year because it's just too transparent. But it obviously worked for him. He's one of the largest hedge fund in the world. Last I heard is over $150 billion. And yeah. the reason it is, is that his returns are phenomenal. So yeah. those kind of, it's always a really good book of principles. That, that's another one I read a couple of years ago that, yeah. that I recommend if that moves your needle. Yeah, I, I love I love, I love love the anecdote about principles in particular too, because I feel that same same reason I, I, an early founder, when, when I was when I was kind of talking about a product, they were, I was worried about like discussing it with other founders, like is anybody going to steal a product? But it's like the same reason why no one steals a product, why, why, why I think a lot of tech information just given away the playbook, because it's hard to execute and it's hard to yeah. actually implement the lessons and build a beautiful product that actually delivers value to customers. I mean, if it was yeah. easy, then everybody would be doing it, right? You're 100% right. Like when I started with Dell Computer, there were 400 companies making computers. Yeah. Just clone computers, right? We, we just out executed every single one of them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And with, a, with a Startup Grind, when I've got these um, talks that I do, because like a fireside chat, frequently entrepreneurs will come up and they want advice and all that. I say, what's your business? Oh, I can't say what I'm doing. And I look at them and I say, let me tell you something. A taxi driver can have an idea. It's about execution. Yeah. And you not sharing your idea with other people retards your ability to learn from them to yeah. validate whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. And I'm not here and I will never, ever, ever tell you your idea is not going to work. Because yeah. think about, hey, I, hey, Julian, I've got this great idea. I think that millions of people are let strangers into their house <laughs> for a couple bucks. It works. I'm not going to do that, right? <laughs> so just that alone, I'm not going to tell you your business is not going to be successful, right? Because obviously yeah. you're going to be in that dynamic. It's yeah. really all about, are you the founder that has the grit, has the intelligence, has the flexibility, has the humility to go find product market fit and do that? And yeah. the more people you talk to and the more people you bring inside the tent you share your idea with, 99.999 times out of 100, nobody's going to do anything with that. <laughs> no, yeah. Don't worry about it. It's not that great of an idea. It's about your execution. Yeah, well said. Right. And as, as I tell my team, it's better to execute than to be executed. Yeah. That's <laughs> I love that, Lee. It's been such a pleasure. I know we're coming to the end of the show to, to not only learn from your experience, but also how you're building Construction Bevy and 
some of the philosophies you think about when, when building companies and understanding not only delivering value, but scaling a company and what is necessary at the different stages to do so. And last little bit before we give a, 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 an opportunity for you to give us your plugs and where to find you, is there any question I didn't ask you that I should have or anything that we didn't touch upon that we left on the table, anything today? Oh, I could come up with a bunch. The first one is, are entrepreneurs born or made? I think it's both. I think there's yeah. some that are born. I think there's some that are made. Some people didn't want to be an entrepreneur and their husband left them and they had to go start cooking and they built a cookie business or they built a law firm or whatever, right? But I think that one thing I will say, because I'm, I'm 57, it's not like I'm 30. I'm not, I'm not, I am not central casting for startups. I was when I got funded in my 20s and 30s, so I knew it. And on my 25th birthday, Michael Dell sent me overseas as a second expat to go over this. So I, I understand what it's like to be in your 20s and 30s and be full of piss and vinegar and everything else. The one thing I would say is that you really have to find your purpose, right? What is it that really motivates you? Because if you can't motivate yourself, you can't fake it to go motivate your employees, motivate your investors, motivate your customers. So find your purpose in life. Find what is it that really drives the needle for you and then just pour kerosene on it. Yeah. <laughs> I love that, Lee. And last thing is, where can we find you? Where can we be a fan of not only, you know, your company, but you as a founder? Give us your LinkedIn's. Obviously, we have your medium, which we'll throw into the show notes, but anywhere else where we can find you and be a fan. Yeah, so it's constructionbevy.com. Bevy is a, a group of like-minded people. So constructionbevy.com, I think it's LinkedIn forward slash Lee Blaylock. It's Lee Blaylock on Twitter. And, and then also on Medium, there's several things, and I don't know what the URL is, but if you just type in Lee, B-L-A-Y-L-O-C-K, Medium Construction Baby, I'm pretty easy to find. And also, if you go to startupgrind.com forward slash Dallas, you can see over 100 entrepreneurs that I've interviewed over the last 10 years and <laughs> learned from about probably 60, 70% of them have become personal friends. Amazing, Lee. It's been such a pleasure to have you on the show. I hope you enjoyed yourself, and thank you again for being on Behind Company Live today. Likewise. Pleasure, and keep grinding. Of course.